Well, it's been some time. Yeah. Uh, I think it was um, 38 years. Really? Yeah. Since I last um, made an interview like this. Yeah. And uh, it was actually here in Stockholm. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I've often wondered um, if we'd meet again, because mm -hmm. um, uh, I obviously have a lot of questions. And, and, and now that um, we meet again, um, I'm, I'm really happy to see you. And uh, um, I don't know, but but uh, I I think you you have so many stories uh, to tell. <laughs> So, um, so in 1973, you had been on the farm for like four or we five came, years. We came in in uh, 71. In 71. So uh, I came when it was really uh, um, pretty fresh, right? And um, the roads the roads were paved from the head of the roads all the way down to this to the store now. They are, <laughs> yeah. No, it was it was rougher in those days. But you, uh, you, you lived in caravans still, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you had started building houses. And um, I mean, if you're 38 years old today and you have kids that are 14, you <laughs> you were a baby. Yeah, we have farm kids, farm grandkids, and Tennessee in-laws. Yeah. So, I mean, what was the farm about? Well, that's the thing. That, that's one of the first questions that people usually ask, and we had no idea we were going to do such a thing. And these uh, preachers came from all over the United States, and they wanted to study the hippies. And they got kind of taken over by the establishment, and they ended up talking to social workers and cops and people like that. And I was the only hippie who addressed them. And they left unhappy. And then a few of them came back a few weeks later and said, what we want to do is take Stephen around on to all of our home, hometowns and have him uh, uh, speak there. So I told uh, the class, which I've been meeting with a thousand people every Monday for years, I told them that I'm going to go on this speaking tour. They said they wanted to go too. They said, well, I only have one bus, <laughs> which I was living in. And uh, so when it came time for me to go, other people had bought buses. We had 25 buses when we pulled out. And we went to 42 states. And things happened on the road. We had babies. You know, we. I learned how to talk to cops. Uh, we were okay with the cops. They would turn us over at the state line to, to the next cops at the next state and say, these guys are okay. And that started in uh, Oregon when we first left. And the cops picked us up. The judge said, what are you doing? He said, we are the people who are for peace, who are peaceful about being for peace. And he said, you better go on your speaking tour then and you come back at the end of it, and I will know what you were. So that was the deal. So we, we went on that, and, and marvelous adventures, just all kinds of stuff happened, and met all kinds of people. And We had a baby in Ripley, New York. We parked in front of the church. They rang the church bells when the baby was born. We asked the cops, where should we park the caravan? And they said, on all the parking meters downtown. <laughs> and. Uh, that was in the newspaper, and a, uh, a doctor came to find who's this who delivered the baby. He said, I'd like to give you some training, and gave Ina May her first lessons. And uh, so we were having a pretty good time. We thought, well, somebody had blown off a bomb in the heat, in the heat area. And I went to the police station there, and I said, I meet with a thousand people every week, and you don't have to be at war with us and we're not after you, and we're okay with you. 
and this cop was very pleased that I come in and made peace with him. And uh, when we uh, came back into the city, we thought, well, we should make the biggest splash we can coming back home. So we went over to Oakland so we'd come in on the Bay Bridge and came down off the Bay Bridge onto Montgomery Street right into the financial district. And just, wow, cops coming out of the woodwork. There was just loads of cops coming out to see us and everybody. We had traffic blocked in every direction for a long way. And so as the cops were coming, the f first one in front was the one that I had talked to. And as soon as he saw it was me, he turned around and he went like this to the other cops. And they all turned around and left. He knew, knew us, knew we were in no trouble. He knew where we parked all the time anyway. So he gave us a police escort across town to where we parked. And we, uh, so we stayed for a, a week. And during that week, we found out that the scene had gone decadent. There was bad dope, there was heroin, there was crack, there was cocaine. Uh, there was, there was a, a crime on the street. It, uh, it wasn't safe anymore. It used to be safe for baby hippies. <laughs> it wasn't safe anymore. And we said, we, we don't even want to stay here anymore. So we only stayed a week, and we left the next weekend. And we went back east. And there were two places that had been particularly nice to us on the caravan. One of them was Anoka, Minnesota, which is about like the weather here. And, but the people were very nice to us, and they just said, well, down here to the laundromat, down here to the grocery store, down here to the filling station, down here to the garage, and just fixed us up like that. And the other place that had been nice to us was in Nashville, music city, country music, and they'd been nice to us. So we didn't go to Anoka because it was too cold. So we went to Nashville, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers had built a new uh, RV park for Opryland, and no one had used it yet. And they just turned that over to us to park while we looked for land. And we had a nice place to park, a hot water showers, and uh, uh, people came and interviewed us. And, and that worked for a while, and uh, I thought, we're a huge organism, we should have a voice, we should have a band. So one of the guys who was a musician says, well, I got to go and turn this 12-string folk guitar and get me a solid body rock and roll guitar. And so while he was in the music store, told our story to the music lady at the music store, and she said, my father has a place down in Lewis County, Tennessee, where nobody's lived in 35 years, and we'll loan that to you to park on while you look for land. So we went down to Lewis County. And there we were uh, met by uh, Homer Sanders, who was uh, an old moonshiner, a real one. He, and uh, he was very good to us, and he explained us to the other neighbors, <laughs> and uh, it was quite nice to us. And we, uh, we wanted a tractor, and this guy went out and he bought a tractor, one of the little Ford tractors with small back wheels and wide front wheels. And we had a guy with us who had used to ride with the Hells Angels. And he said, that's not a tractor. <laughs> and so he went out to find a tractor, and he found this big old green giant with big back wheels and all that, you know, like he wanted. Mm -hmm. And the guy we bought that tractor from said, if you guys are looking for land, I have a 1,000 acres here, and the road doesn't go through. And we went over and we looked at it, and it looked pretty good. So we went to the uh, county seat to the bank and ask them about borrowing money to buy that land. And they said, well, it's not just that you're these out-of-town hippies that nobody knows, <laughs> but it's also the most money anyone's ever asked for at this bank. And so we went back and told the guy that, and he says, I trust you guys, I'll carry it myself. So we moved in, and with 275 people to work with, we didn't have a hard time making the land payment. <laughs> we paid him off in two or three years. And, uh, so that, we lived in the buses at first. The neighbors said, you guys would never survived if you hadn't been there in the buses. You, you would not have got through the first winter. And uh, we uh, got about the business of making a town. Hmm. 
That's great. So um, you were also the spiritual leader. Yeah, from doing the Monday night class. Yes. So I I hadn't planned on making a community. I was going to keep on doing my meetings. Mm. And now we're here and we're making a community. And I drove the first bus and made the deals with the cops at the state lines and mm -hmm. had, was in that position. And nobody minded me doing that. So I just kept on doing that. And the way the farm grew from there, uh, one of uh, Anna May, Pamela's uh, midwife friend, Pamela, husband came out and I was walking down the caravan with a hammer banging on the front bumper to wake up everybody so we'd all leave at once. And he came by and says, give me the hammer, you go have breakfast. And things and things like that just kept happening. Somebody said, I know how to do that, let me do that for you. And so we just gradually built a, an organically grown group of people who knew what to do and how to do it and like that. So we, uh, first off, we, uh, there was, there was, the well wasn't big enough to do anything for us. It was, it was just for one house. And so we were taking water out of the stream and, and purifying it. And uh, some people began to build houses and, and uh, we went out and we asked the neighbors how to do things and the neighbors would tell us how to do things and they helped us out. And old Homer Saunders, who's the man, the moonshiner, and it's funny, we get reminded of him. He's been dead for a while, but we get reminded of him because for some reason, the GPS calls our road, Homer Saunders Road. Right. And so he could, every time we come home, the GPS says, Homer Saunders Road, mm -hmm. a German accent. He is the one who had the sawmill, is, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. He had the sawmill, and, mm -hmm. and we didn't realize how tacky he was uh, until we found out that he'd built a, Tin button pad for a sawmill that ran it, and uh, that he also. Uh, years later, uh, they were decommissioning the Redstone Arsenal, and they called Homer out of retirement because he knew so much about how it had been built. We thought he was quite tacky, <laughs> and uh, he thought we were cute. <laughs> you know, and, and he'd said things like, in the winter time, if you got people who can't stay warm. Send them over here, and they can sleep in my house. Mm -hmm. He's like, okay. Mm -hmm. He always said, he always said about troubles, our troubles. And he loved us, and we took, we loved him too. And when our parents began to come visit us, I mean, his parents, my parents, they all met him, and decided he was okay, and he decided they were okay. <laughs> so we, and he built a beautiful relationship from the ground up with the local people. And uh, people really got good at doing things and learning things. And so we've been there for 40 years now. And there was no dirt, there was no uh, paved roads on the place. Now we've got paved road all the way to the middle of the property. And uh, in about 1980 something, it became obvious that I had used up my usefulness for as far as running things go. And it sort of just gradually changed that people quit asking me how to do things and started doing it for themselves. And I was unemployed pretty quickly, which I didn't mind because I'd been on duty for yeah. quite a while. Mm -hmm. So we've become world famous since then. And uh, I produced books for a while. I've four or five books I've done about Monday Night Class in the Caravan and uh, uh, a few other ones. And uh, Amazing Dope Tales. Amazing Dope Tales, absolutely. <laughs> People like that, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get a lot of letters about that one. Okay. And uh, in 1980, yeah. You, you were awarded um, the Right Livelihood Award, right? Yes, I was. And uh, uh, one day somebody says, there's a guy up at the gate wants to talk to you. And uh, so I went to go see him, and it was Yaakov, 
Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm going, to, I'm going to give you this award. Well, I, people say a lot of things, so I didn't pay much attention to it. And several months later, I was in Seattle. They called me up from the farm and says, the guy's calling you up from Sweden. And I talked to him and he said, I'm arranging your plane fight to come over here and we're going to give you the right livelihood award. And I don't remember exactly how much it was. It was less than a tenth of what I is getting. Yeah, something like that, yeah. About $3,500, mm, 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 I think. Mm, mm. And it was very nice. I was treated very well when I came here and became a, a friends with Yagov and, uh, and pretty much out of a job as running the farm goes. And uh, some people would come to me for advice about stuff anyhow, but I, I wasn't... Uh, I had never been the titular head of the farm, and then it became, you know, just a job description for a while. And mm -hmm. the farm runs itself, and uh, by 81 or 82, we call it the changes, because when we first went in, we were completely collective, which was the only way we could survive. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't buy the land or anything if we weren't collective like that. And what I threw into the collectivity was I had published a, a Monday night class and uh, every time we sold out, we just take all.